Hi everyone, I'm Eugene, I use he, him pronouns. And I'm Thomas, and I use he and they pronouns. And we are here in week nine, strike syllabus, it's week nine, racism, security, and capitalism in COVID times, um, where we're going to talk about all sorts of fun stuff. It's going to be great. <laughs> So uh, to start off, we'll talk about a little bit of updates uh, from UC Santa Cruz COLA news review things. Um, on April 27th, UC Santa Cruz Wildcat Strikers announced that they had planned to submit grades in response to the university's change in policy regarding missing how they were going to be handling missing grades. Uh, nevertheless, uh, although uh, Santa Cruz Wildcat Strikers did submit grades, UC Santa Cruz admin continued to conduct summons and disciplinary proceedings against graduate students in May, leveling accusations of theft and forgery for removing grades from the university's digital gradebook. Um, so it's already kind of wild and like bad that um, this admin is pursuing um, disciplinary proceedings and summons amidst a kind of university campus shutdown and global health pandemic, um, but even worse that many of the students who were suspended in these actions lost access to student health and emergency services, according to the report that I've linked. I mean, the first thing here, and to give some context of how this is affecting other people on campus or the kind of amount of work and time and energy that's being um, required of this um, in an open letter from the UCSC faculty organizing group, um, the faculty say that in total, we estimate that assistant professors have spent at least 2,000 hours engaged in hearings and other activities related to our students' punishment, intimidation, and dismissal. So that's a sort of a broad idea of some of the big things that are going on, but even more specifically, um, there's a report that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, Vice initially broke it, and um, other websites wrote about it as well. Salon, which I've linked in the notes. Um, to this slide, that UC Santa Cruz police use military surveillance in their efforts to suppress the wildcat strike. Um, the Cal this is like kind of nitty gritty detail, I don't quite understand necessarily, but the California National Guard provided friendly force trackers, which are military surveillance technology used to track US troops military combat in order to monitor the picket. Um, police responding to the strike also had access to LEAP, which is a federal surveillance portal operated by the FBI. And the California Office of Emergency Services assisted with law enforcement response. And members of this office were in contact with the California Threat Assessment Center, which is funded by the Department of Homeland Security. So this is all um, quite grim and bad. And these reports that I've linked in these notes um, kind of outline exactly the technology that was involved and the different capacities in which they were utilized, um, or the sort of discussion around that. But the FBI has a long history of surveilling protest movements, as these articles point out. The FBI, um, Emails and, intel and intelligence reports suggested there was federal surveillance of Black Lives Matter protests, for in instance, and similar surveillance happened in the 1960s and 70s during anti-war protests, which is a phenomenon that we talked about a few weeks ago as involving UC, Center, or UC um, graduate student activists. And so we're talking about this. Um, oh, and so some students from UC Santa Cruz were asked or sort of offered some of their experiences and insight into um, this revelation about the use of surveillance technology on strikers. One student, Veronica Hamilton, a PhD student in, psych in psychology at Santa Cruz, said the university acts like they don't have any money and can't afford to pay people living wages, but the amount of money they spent on this is such overkill, which sort of resonates with what the faculty were commenting about the sort of time investment that was required of all the disciplinary actions. Um, literature PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, Hannah Newburn, was quoted as saying, since when did asking for a raise become a threat to Homeland Security? And then Carlos Cruz, a history PhD student at Santa Cruz, um, talks about how he said, quote, I had a sergeant who was able to identify me by first, middle, and last name and date of birth, adding that there were racist undertones to the exchange. And so these kinds of ideas, these quotes specifically, like sort of connection to Homeland Security and kind of racial undertones of this surveillance and the exchanges that were seem to have been informed by it. Lead us into the topic we're gonna to talk about today um, in a couple of ways. And first, it's important to note this stuff just because it's outrageous and bad um, to think about. We already were aware of the sort of massive police involvement with UC Santa Cruz um, sort of protest suppression, um, but to see this kind of other level of it is quite grim. It is also symptomatic of broader trends of surveillance in this country, which is costly and deeply rooted in um, sort of racism and xenophobia. And so today in our examples, we're gonna unpack some instances of that, look at how we have gotten to this moment in which surveillance um, is so invasive and such the norm, and also look at what that might mean for us in amidst our current COVID atmosphere. So thanks, Thomas. A good place to start as 
use many things with um, with like surveillance is the Patriot Act, um, which is a um, which is the uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act, which sounds like it, it's from a comic book. Um, but it was originally passed six weeks after um, the tragedy of 9-11 and was hammered through the US legislature in three days. And the reason that this is important is because most legislators who were voting on it didn't read it in its entirety. Um, also, there were no amendments allowed. It was really like as written has to go through and it was very heavily implied by the uh, W. Bush administration that it, people that weren't voting for it were anti-American. I mean, it has patriot in the name, so like, you're not a patriot. I mean, it's premised on xenophobic fears, um, explicitly tying terrorism to uh, Arabs, Arab Americans, um, and like, and creating these new categories that were racially motivated. Um, the, the provisions of the act and of the different sections were supposed to sunset after five years, meaning they expire um, and have in all cases been extended. So we're almost 20 years out from the act and almost everything in it is intact from when it was passed. Um, there are four areas in which the, there was increasing power for government surveillance. One was record searches. So expanding the government's ability to look at records on an individual's activity being held by third parties. So broadly, any businesses, including like the library. Secret searches, it, could ex it expands the government's ability to search private property without notice to the owner. Um, intelligence searches, expanding a narrow exception to the Fourth Amendment that had been created for the collection of foreign intelligence information. And trap and trace searches, expanding another Fourth Amendment exception for spying that collects addressing information about the origin and destination of communications as opposed to the content. So um, for the first one, record searches, section 215 comes up um, in a couple slides. So that's good to remember. Um, what this created was things like warrantless wiretaps, which were wiretaps that were taken without legally required judicial oversight and lone wolf provisions, which allows the government to surveil someone who might be engaged in international terrorism if they're not actually connected to any existing terrorist group. So apparently this hadn't been used before, uh, or it hasn't been used, but um, soon after 9-11, um, because of whistleblowers like Snowden, major telecom providers such as AT&T and Verizon agreed to provide vast amounts of call detail records to the federal government, which continued into the 2010s um, as a push for this kind of like surveillance that was needed at the time. In 2015, um, this USA Freedom Act, Uniting and Strengthening America by Fulfilling Rights and Ending Eavesdropping, Drive Collection and Online Monitoring Act, I really think there is someone that writes these really long act names that just really get to this stuff, which is, the idea was being, that was supposed to put some limits on the Patriot Act. There was an, a Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board that reviewed the Patriot Act and what had been happening in 2014 and showed that Section 215, the data collection section, um, offers little unique value here and offering additional leads to contacts of terrorism, suspects already known to investigators, instead largely duplicating the FBI's own information gathering efforts. And also, they found that they have not identified a single instance involving a threat to the United States in which telephone records program made a concrete difference in the outcome of counterterrorism investigation. Moreover, we are aware of no instance in which the program directly contributed to the discovery of a previously unknown terrorist plot or disruption of a terrorist attack. So showing that the, the idea behind this of like stopping terrorism, especially premised on um, these xenophobic, anti-Islamic, anti-Arab movements, hasn't been shown to do anything. But at the, sa at the same token, this Freedom Act actually restored authorization for roving wiretaps and tracking the wolves. So even though it does set some limits, um, especially on like bulk collection and having this intelligent surveillance court release novel interpretations of the law, it was still expanding and extending uh, the Patriot Act to the present moment. This is important because the Patriot Act and the Freedom Act are both up to be renewed by Congress during the session. And that <laughs> actually right freaking now. <laughs> um, in March, the House passed a long-term extension of both. And then in May, uh, just last week, or two weeks ago now, time's hard. Um, the Senate passed an extension of the act that um, 
that some senators had introduced privacy protections that didn't pass because senators didn't show up to vote, which is super great. Um, but what it does is right now, what we are facing is in our present moment, because of COVID, because of emergencies, um, that we are, um, there are no protections of internet browsing and search histories from warrantless surveillance. And as we'll show, and as I'm sure you are very aware, um, uh, there's a lot of data out there <laughs> that is kind of like running wild and free um, on the internet, but the fact that it's like warrantless surveillance by the government of search history and internet browsing is a bit, um, it's a bit concerning. Why this ties in and why, why we're linking this to COVID is there's something called syndromic surveillance, which are methods relying on the detection of individual and population health indicators that are discernible before concern, confirmed diagnoses are made. So the idea is that prior to a laboratory confirmation, before you get a test, um, ill people may exhibit behavioral patterns, symptoms, signs, or other laboratory findings that can be tracked. Um, it was, it's been, it is a type of surveillance that has been in the loop specifically for the early detection of covert bioterrorist attacks, but is being thought of for COVID as a way to increase surveillance on people and to make, to see vectors of contagion. A case study that is, is kind of showing these is in property technology or prop tech. Um, I came across this and was spooked, and so that's why I'm talking about it today. Um, but currently tech companies are pushing, using surveillance and data-driven tracking devices as an effective method to deal with concerns of landlords around rent strikes, eviction moratoriums, and remote property management. The idea being that you can expand and centralize the power of landlords to surveil and classify tenants. Now this is an issue because of the forward thinking idea of this technology. The fact that if right now under a global pandemic, you might have talked about a rent strike or perhaps participated in one, um, demanding that your tenant kind of recognize that people don't have money right now and it's a, it's a tight time. You could be put on a list and be denied um, a, like a rental application because of these like interlocking technologies that are trying to be produced to protect landlords. And again, this is um, I, I think that we come through time and time again when we were talking about housing back in week two or three, um, that it is to protect the like landowning class and is not to protect um, renters or people who are working. Um, this is all to create an interconnected regime of surveillance and oversight that disempowers tenants and conditions access to shelter on much more than the ability to pay rent. So the prop tech boomed after the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis, which we've talked about before, um, which includes racist lending practices that left over 240,000 black residents um, without homes, active, losing their homes because of what happened. Um, the Blackstone conglomerate, which is composed of Wall Street investment firms, has created a mega firm to purchase foreclosed homes at auction, creating the largest landowning firm globally and is the biggest landlord in the United States. Also recall that Airbnb is from, is a direct outgrowth of the 2008 crisis, um, which has caused its own slew of, of issues in major urban areas throughout the world. Now the claims of prop tech are that they can distinguish between those who belong in a neighborhood or on a street and those who don't. And they use artificial intelligence powered technology like license plate surveillance or facial recognition technology. The Amazon Ring, which Thomas will talk about later as well, is home surveillance tech that notifies landlords and police of people who don't look like they belong. It could be automated since Amazon has partnered with over 600 police departments, I need to change that, 600 uh, in the US to give them unfettered access to ring surveillance footage. And it's specifically terrible because it's known to misrecognize and falsely identify um, people of color. These are used to surveil black and brown bodies um, as like degenerates, as, as people who are um, subjected to increased surveillance already. The idea, what, to do these things that PropTech claims, it will need to implement widespread biometric collecting surveillance tech, so facial recognition technology, maintain databases with people who are permitted in certain places and who are uninfected. And this has to be updated in real time. 
It needs to track where people are going for possible vectors of contagion and integrate with other surveillance technologies available. This is a huge ask and a huge like imposition on like what surveillance technologies can do. So the like the, like utopic vision of this like surveilled society is that it can do all of these things very easily, which it's not easy, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> what it, be, the reason that this is concerning is that often technology offers itself as a easy, uncomplicated solution. That if the technology exists, it will not be used for bad things. And in fact, it's just like wonderful and useful. Um, Clearview, um, an AI software company that loves racial recognition tech, its CEO said it's really up to those agencies how they put these programs together. All we do is provide the identification part of the process as if, um, to use a terrible metaphor, building the guns doesn't mean they care about where they go, right? They're just like offering them to the world. Um, a couple um, authors for the New York Times said that the fast pace of the pandemic is promoting governments to put in place a patchwork of digital surveillance measures in the name of their own interests with little international coordination on how appropriate or effective they are. That's Natasha Singer and Chloe song Hoon. And that these emergencies that we see, like 9-11, like the 2008 crisis, now yield short-term measures that become the only choice and are mechanized for long-term use. Think about the Patriot Act, which was passed in 2001, that is still in place, largely intact till today. That was a, sh like a quick anti-terrorism bill that continues to be used. Um, some global concerns um, with tech right now is in late April, Facebook's Data for Good team, which gross, Facebook has a Data for Good team, announced new tools for tracking how well people are doing this at social distancing by using location data. Google also is using its readouts to reveal phenomenal, phenomenal level of detail that include changes in visits to people's homes, determined by signals where users spend their time during the day and night. So it's, we know that our phones are actively logging everything we're doing, everywhere we're going. But the fact that it's being paired with like, wow, we are like changing our habits, um, which goes into what Thomas will talk about in like this grand experiment of COVID in, in how it's going to change education and our access to health and things like that. Dermalog in Germany and Telpo in China are pitching facial recognition technology as a method for identifying individuals without the risk of close contact. So instead of using um, fingerprints using facial recognition technology as like a better and safer alternative. The Thai government already uses this technology for border control. Russia is using facial recognition technology to track people who leave quarantine. It's actually having the police being called on people who might leave their house to take out the trash, etc. And in Hong Kong, um, there are renewed protests because of a national security and anti-sedition law, which is criminalizing treason, secession, and sedition and subversion against the central government, against China. And it will enable the Chinese national security organs to operate in the city to fulfill relevant duties to safeguard national security in accordance with the law. So these uh, technologies of surveillance are not just unique to the United States, and are in fact being implemented worldwide in these short-term uh, reaches for, uh, for solutions to COVID and what it can offer. You're muted, Sweetums. Hello. Oh, um, well, that being said, um, we will talk about the U.S. in this next part and just some of the ways in which surveillance and corporate profits are sort of intersecting in our envisionings of the world sort of post-pandemic. And these next couple slides I'm going to talk about come basically directly from Naomi Sline's piece for The Intercept on the Screen New Deal. It's a component of the Green New Deal. And it's what she's calling a pandemic shock doctrine. And the kind of case study that she talks about that we'll talk about here is in New York. Um, New York's Governor Cuomo recently announced a partnership with former Google CEO Eric Schmidt to address the state's post-pandemic future. And part of this vision, as Schmidt recounted it in his press conference, where Cuomo announced this, was that the first priorities of what we're trying to do are focused on telehealth, remote learning, and broadband. We need to use technology to make things better. So it's a very kind of tech utopia kind of idea about how we're going to have this contactless, remote um, access to things that you used to be doing in person. 
Um, Cuomo announced a similar partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation regarding remote learning technology. And when he was talking about this, which was like the, I think, believe the day before, um, he announced the partnership with Schmidt. Um, Cuomo said, all these buildings, all these physical classrooms, why, with all the technology you have? So it's been envisioning this very, um, I guess, utopic, like just like certainly different, um, kind of contactless, technologically driven future. And so there are some um, obvious issues with this. We can go to the next slide. Thanks, sorry. Um, so surveillance, even though this isn't being pitched as a surveillance project, it's pitched as a way to bring technology into the home to make things more accessible from the home. Surveillance is an obvious drawback um, to this kind of contactless dystopian vision. And Naomi Klein, when she, um, in this article, she talks about it, says that um, the, what Schmidt and other um, tech CEOs like him are laying out is a future in which our every move, our every word, our every relationship is trackable, traceable, and data mineable by unprecedented collaborations between government and tech giants, uh, which we're seeing obviously with Cuomo and Schmidt and the Gateses. And so um, Eugene mentioned ring doorbell earlier, and that's sort of maybe a precedent of what we might expect from these like privatized surveillance technologies that get implemented into the home and then are turned over like immediately um, to police or other kind of state militarized um, groups. Uh, so Eugene mentioned earlier this kind of partnerships that ring has made with police departments. So there's a kind of structural literal way in which technology like ring um, kind of feeds into these um, kind of problematic and um, bad um, social structures we have. There's also the kind of informal or more like um, quotidian way in which technologies like this can um, in in intersect with and um, enlarge or create a space for more sort of racist discourse. Um, so Ring has a neighbors app, which is like a social media kind of place where you can share um, images from your Ring photo and kind of turns, it's kind of like a online neighborhood watch. Um, where everyone's kind of empowered to report on what's happening to them. And studies, um, and I've linked them again in the notes here, um, this Fox article, which talks about um, the Neighbors app is a breeding ground for hyper-local racialized bias and discrimination. So um, there's like already, we have the issue of like police um, disproportionately targeting black and brown people in their um, official capacity. But on the app, there is a study showing that a majority of crime, a majority of photos that are shared and um, accusing or sort of targeting people for as um, criminals are people of color and that um, even sort of more neutral images, images where no sort of obvious crime has been committed will often be posted by white people with um, racist captions calling black or brown people thugs or gang members or things of that nature. So in both a structural and kind of informal way, technology like this um, feeds, is like already premised on, but further reinforces um, kind of racial bias and racialized fears about security and property. Um, and so as bad as those things are, surveillance and these kinds of private partnerships with the police or military are not a byproduct of the vision of the future that Schmidt and Cuomo are offering. They're actually its premise. Um, and so many of the ideas that Schmidt is advancing were things he developed before the pandemic. He was pitching these um, all throughout like 2018 and 2019. He was formulating his ideas and presenting them in presentations outside of a context of the pandemic, um, especially in his capacity as a member of the Defense Innovation Board. And the Defense Innovation Board advises the Department of Defense on increased use of artificial intelligence in the military. So it was in this kind of very militarized homeland security, like um, national defense context in which Schmidt was developing all of these ideas and propositions for technology. Um, he also served as chair for the powerful National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, or NSCAI. And this commission advises Congress on advances in artificial intelligence on the premise of addressing the national and economic security needs of the United States, including economic risk. So it's in these contexts of national security, national interest, and national competition, that a lot of these um, technologies that are currently being peddled to us as kind of contactless, safe, post-pandemic technologies were actually developed and are now being rebranded. Did I duplicate this slide? I did. So we can skip the next week, okay. So uh, just to show, this is um, from a presentation that Schmidt gave through the NSCAI, which was um, made public through a Freedom of Information Request Act. I have more information on that in the notes. This is the um, slide that Schmidt was presenting on where he talked, and it kind of shows the ways in which surveillance is the premise of all the technology, where he says surveillance is the one of the first and best customers for artificial intelligence. He says, this is like, 
this threw me for a loop as far as like language and tone choice from like Eric Schmidt, Google, former Google CEO, but um, Master Islands is a killer application for deep learning. So um, an entire generation of AI unicorns is collecting the bulk of their early revenue from government security contracts. So it's just kind of really highlighting and foregrounding and in a very uncritical and laudatory way, the ways in which private corporations are profiting from and building their technology off of government sponsored surveillance. We can skip the rest of the slide or the rest of it. Um, so there's the one hand in which um, the government's apparatuses for surveillance, which have been particularly heightened since our like, Islamophobic response um, to 9-11 and ideations around that um, are going on. There's also a different sort of register in which Schmidt is pitching this technology that is sort of separate from the surveillance and technology um, component. And that is that Schmidt has framed competition with China as the primary imperative for implementing this tech. And this is again, before the pandemic, uh, all throughout last year, he was saying it was competition with China that was the sort of main motivator for this um, technology he was pushing. And so according to Schmidt, and again, um, Naomi Klein goes into this in much more detail in the article that I linked, but according to Schmidt, the Chinese government is willing to spend limitless public money building the infrastructure of high-tech surveillance while allowing Chinese tech companies to pocket the profits from these applications. And as such, with these kinds of um, confluence, a confluence of things, Schmidt claims the U.S.'s dominant position in the global economy is on the precipice of collapsing. Um, he's made alarmist claims about how China's lax regulatory infrastructure and its embrace of surveillance are causing it to pull ahead of the U.S. in a number of fields, which of course, all this kind of rhetoric makes sense if we are remembering that he's presenting this research or these, whatever research, these kinds of ideas in like Department of Defense kinds of venues. On the presentation that I showed earlier, he notes that China, that in China, tech companies have the authority to quickly clear regulatory barriers, while American initiatives are mired in HIPAA compliance and FDA approval. So things like HIPAA, which are like um, protecting you know, our privacy, our health privacy, and the FDA are framed in this sort of worldview as obstacles, as bad, as um, kind of hindrances on the developing the technologies as, as necessary to make us competitive with China. Um, he expressed some of these claims, so this was all based on the presentation he gave that I showed the slides of earlier, but he expressed some of these claims in a New York Times op-ed entitled, I used to run Google, Silicon Valley could lose to China. And he published this earlier this year before the pandemic hit the US. And at that time he was public, he was um, talking about this completely not in pandemic terms. It's only since um, lockdown measures have been sort of unevenly implemented here that this is something he's able to rebrand um, kind of wholesale as a contactless and the kind of frictionless um, post-pandemic world. As all this was going on, um, he was giving these presentations and talks advocating this kind of vision of the necessity for surveillance technology to help the U.S.'s place in the world. The NSCAI issued an interim report to Congress further raising the alarm about the need for the U.S. to match China's pursuit of surveillance tech. And it said, quote, we are in a strategic competition in which AI will be at the center the future of our national security and economy are at stake. So again, this is all um, very much tracks onto the context in which Schmidt was like giving these kinds of presentations and leading these reports it was in Department of Defense, um, kind of Homeland Security adjacent um, departments. It also harkened back for me, at least to the earlier quotes I was um, kind of reading off about um, Homeland Security, like the student who asked, what's Homeland Security's interest in this protest? Why are we a threat to Homeland Security? And so just the way in which this has become kind of all encompassing of many surveillance projects. More importantly, if we're thinking about the various ways in which um, kind of racial or xenophobic terror are um, the kind of rhetorical inroads that these companies are making, like what we talked about on um, the homophobia and the Patriot Act, the stuff that Schmidt is peddling in these presentations is very much like um, a kind of yellow peril, um, which was a sort of imperial colonial era kind of idea that um, China or like the Orient um, posed this huge threat to the existence and the survival of the West. And so this is being repackaged in Schmidt's comments and in Schmidt's sort of framing of these things as national security concerns in which China is the main competitor um, in order to sort of make his claim that he should be getting government funding to develop this technology. So it's showing a kind of very unsettling confluence of a lot of the things we talked about today, but also in some of the other um, presentations that we've given. Yeah, and I think, um, Thomas, your comments are so apt and, and tie into the Patriot Act, right? Like the, the US government right before the um, passing the Patriot Act was actually um, kind of pushing against big tech and this kind of surveillance data. But after 
180 and I'll grant it all the things that were kind of going against. And I, I think with talking about um, Bill and Melinda Gates and talking about Schmidt, it's that these billionaires are seen as like lauded as visionaries when actually all they're doing is trying to get public funds to, to advance their own companies and their own interests. It's like exactly right. And then Which, remember, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, a couple of things, billionaire, that's kind of whatever. Loving the billionaires thing is how we got Trump in the first place. Like, okay, we have a nicer Trump. That's chill. Um, then yeah, even about like the same thing. Naomi Klein talks about like how like automated like driverless cars were killing people last year, and we all hated that. And now it's like, no, it's good. You can get your food without anyone touching it. Um, yeah, just um, this kind of crisis is really kind of allows us to ram through things that were really contentious beforehand. Yeah, and all of his comments are really falling into this like, well, the technology is good. Like, there's nothing wrong with the technology. It's like a pure solution. To everything that's happening. So give me money, please. <laughs> <laughs> so where do we go from here? I think is is what the last couple slides will talk about, and what is actually at stake. So going back to the Patriot Act, the ACLU and 128 groups in 2001 signed um, a document called "In Defense of Freedom at a Time of Crisis." And some excerpts that I thought really applied to our context now is: We need to ensure that actions by our government uphold the principles of a democratic society accountable government and international law, and that all decisions are taken in a manner consistent with the Constitution. We can, as we have in the past in times of war and peace, reconcile the requirements of security with the demands of liberty. We should resist the temptation to enact proposals in the mistaken belief that anything that may be called anti-terrorist will necessarily provide greater security. Note that in all of these conversations are still about terrorism or the fear that someone will use this time of insecurity to like deploy um, like terrorist attacks rather than being wary of a government doing the same exact thing. Um, we should resist efforts to target people because of their race, religion, ethnic background or appearance, including immigrants in general, Arab Americans and Muslims. Um, yes. And I know I've heard of this earlier, but the, um, about not targeting people or race. I, I mean, he's not running for president anymore, but that bookhead Bloomberg, um, just like the way they like, were cracking down on mosques, using this kind of surveillance uh, as a pretense to crack down on Muslim communities in New York. Yeah. yeah, exactly that. And then lastly, we affirm the right of peaceful dissent protected by the First Amendment now when it is most at risk. Um, yeah. So this is the um, last quote. Do you want to read this, Thomas, or are you okay if I read it? I, if you want to read it, you can, but you know I love my mother, Naomi Klein. Why don't you read it, since this is, this is not about Naomi Klein. Okay, a lot of the narratives that we've heard early on about countries that successfully controlled the virus was attributed to these kinds of apps, to this kind of security. She's talking about um, what Thomas was mentioning earlier about like China and very authoritarian crackdowns that happened early on um, in like February, March. And that narrative is a very convenient one for these tech companies. And in many cases, it erases the role of a functioning public healthcare system, of the fact that it was not merely an app that was placed voluntarily on people's phones, but a well-staffed public health system that allowed human tracing and tracking of the virus, which means a human being, not an alert on your phone, but a human being calls you. Best of all, a human being in your community, someone you might trust who speaks your language and says, okay, you may have come in contact with a virus. What would you need to be able to self-quarantine? Can we get you a hotel room? Can we help to make sure that your kids are cared for? And so this is what we're getting at in thinking, the question isn't just security or no. It is not more surveillance or less. It actually is hiding the fact that the root of this problem was a, is a healthcare problem and the ability for our healthcare system to respond in the midst of a crisis. And that in this kind of moment, when people are, tech companies are trying to push these privatized, uh, very surveillance heavy things on us, it's not that those are necessarily or inherently bad or shouldn't be used, but it's happening without any kind of democratic public discourse that would allow for these kinds of modulations that like uh, make sure that people are getting good jobs out of this tech and not production of bad exploitative jobs or things of that nature. So it's just, um, it's not that this is like necessarily like the worst thing, but that it's all being kind of push through um, with corporate and elite government interests and not the sort of voices and discourses of people like us who um, might get ring doorbells or put on our front doors or whatever. Um, yeah, and the other thing that is happening is, is like we're teachers uh, at UCSB who are part of this like 
online learning environment where UCSB is currently like trying to get all of these surveys about, well, what went well or what went poorly this quarter as a way of kind of implementing this at home online learning environment that might be this like new cool thing that's going to try to eliminate people from their positions. Just record all your lectures, put them online. We don't have to hire you ever again because you have, we have your ghost on a computer. Um, the, this like surveillance and technology, while it should be used to make our lives easier, is actually just trying to like get rid of people and oversight and just let everything kind of be controlled by these like ghostly tech figures. That's my rant. Anything else to add, Thomas? You good? Great. Cool. Good. Well, next week we're at week 10, which in the, in the UC quarter system is the end of the quarter. So we're gonna have a really, we're gonna have a test for everyone. Uh, <laughs> and the subject generally will be the world is awful, but people are good. So I think at every moment we've tried to show that like these large solutions, these like, these things that are happening at the government level or the like corporate level, the elite level, are kind of creating more issues and more like insecurities, but our solutions have always come from the bottom, for, come from people, come from our communities. I think that's what we, what we want to like finish with after I rant about stuff. Hey, this is going to get mad and rant. We'll talk about like, mutual aid uh, efforts, social welfare campaigns, things of that nature that are going to look at supportive, communitative, generative, community based solutions, things that are going on. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone, and yeah. turn off the recording. So goodbye.